Um, well, first of all, thanks for the invitation because I was sort of one of those people that said I don't do numbers um, at many on many occasions throughout my career, and I was I was struck about the maternity piece because I mean I've seen Derek Burrow in the room brought back the memory of the first time I realised that we are all policymakers, every one of us, um, because uh, I was doing my, my thesis on a local government response to voluntary action, many, 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 in the 70s when I was expecting my eldest son, and in the late stages of pregnancy threatened, threatened all 25 of my other colleagues in local government to fill out a questionnaire so that I ended up with a definitive piece of research, 100% response rate to the survey. Um, the university got quite excited about it because they never ever had a definitive 100% response from local government before. Um, and I didn't realise the power of that and was uh, invited at the time. Um, there was a, quite a bit of work being done in community ser service circles uh, to influence government policy around community services and support for local government and the provision of community services. And I was asked, um, would I put a piece in? So I, I think it was basically the executive summary of my, my, my thesis. And the next thing, about three, four months later, don't I see it reduced verbatim um, as, the, as the policy? And I'm going, oh my God. I thought it was going into sort of this big, you know, tub of information and data. And all, all of a sudden, it was definitive and became definitive and it, it created policy. And it was a, a really wake up moment for me because I thought, you know, that's what evidence is. It's actually gathering up um, the data and then using it and feeding it in. And I think the first thing I would say is there's a real hunger and thirst for it. Um, you know, that within government, people want good evidence. And outside government, people want the evidence used to be genuine and reflective of the lives they live. The lives they live. Um, so, I suppose most recently, um, I've been delighted to have been associated with the Carnegie round table and wellbeing and indeed John is here with us, John Woods today to provide a superb secretariat and Will was also on the round table and that was another, what I liked, I'm, I'm somebody quite hands on and pragmatic, was the, the way that that collated and gathered, uh, not, not least a body of evidence in a variety of ways, but then went on to significantly, and indeed Joe Reynolds with us here uh, within government was a, our secret weapon, as he always is, um, you know, genuinely getting it in and we hit the right moment, and, and to hear Siobhan say that now, you know, evidence is um, that way, it's out, the outcomes orientation now and the linking of it to monitoring and evaluation, because again, throughout my work in life, I've been very much around the whole systems thinking. Um, it used to really frustrate me, you know, as it does many of you, the silos we operate in, and you're, you're, you're working with colleagues, and it, this is everything from academia right through central and local government and, and beyond. Um, down, you know, down the hall, and all of a sudden, in fact, the, the work that Richard Florida did on creative cities um, was at the uh, in the cafe cafeteria where he happened to sit down beside a statistician who was working down the hall, and they suddenly he, he looked and realised that where there were a high number of homosexuals or a small city, you know, there was different characteristics, and they were both pulling out the same characteristics, and they suddenly realised the the analogy between the two, and Richard, all Richard Florida's work around creative cities came out of that chance cup of coffee between colleagues that actually worked in, a, in the one corridor. So it's about opening the doors of the corridor, um, breaking down the silos. Um, the Scottish work that, and that the Alliance have been doing with Carnegie, you know, the Scottish approach to evidence uh, is a really interesting thinking because Scotland are um, held up as exemplars worldwide uh, in terms of prevention, uh, in a prevention type approach, outcomes orientation, and also a co-production approach. And because we're speaking so much now in government about co-production, um, and I don't mind using, using jargon if it's uh, actually, if it means something. And for me, the co-production journey is one that should apply as much to the to the collation and collection of evidence. But you know, there's, we, we need to piggyback on good practice and not reinvent wheels. I commend NISRA because they have, um, from the start, they were, you know, because they were in each government department and because I was involved in, as, as well was in Dell and DECAL, um, the NISRA piece was a little gem within the departments where you had um, professionals in, in, in the right climate, and I know it didn't happen in all departments, who became colleagues uh, with other public servants to actually support and sustain them. So I was particularly pleased that an outcome of the of the wellbeing work that we'd done um, with Carnegie 
uh, NISRA were in from day one, Tracy in particular was really helpful to us, and that one of the outcomes of the, of the round table work was that NISRA and their interaction now with local government, um, and indeed SAB as well now in supporting local government. Because if we can plug the expertise in, and I have nothing but good experience of working with NISRA colleagues at the cold face, they, the likes of me at the head of a department can relax because they go into you know that whole ripple piece of knowing where to get the evidence and to work in line with colleagues who know their business. Um, so the model's already there, and I think the new programme for government is actually enhancing and developing that. But just, we were told, as, as Will summed it up very well, uh, we were told to tell some war stories. Um, so I, I was going to tell one from local government because I know Will will we'll probably tell, tell the central government ones. Um, and it was when I um, actually came out of the common from Dale to Ilex, and we were doing the one plan in Derry. And um, I can genuinely say that the politicians involved, I mean, that was probably one of the biggest ever processes of integrated planning in Northern Ireland. I'd been involved in a smaller uh, one in Fermanagh many years before and really had seen the benefit of an integrated plan. That Indeed, it's now, it's now 15, 20 years old, but it's the cornerstone of the community plan that's there in Fermanagh. And no, later than one day last week, somebody came up and said, do you remember those three days on Lusty Bag Island um, back in 19-whatever? So I can't remember what my son was can't even remember what age he was, many years ago, and somebody said, you know, that's all coming back round again, and I thought, oh my goodness, um, but that's legacy for you. But when, when we went um, in Derry, it was such, there was such a political piece to it, um, to try and get, uh, I can't remember, I think it was 100, and, there was 80 strategic plans for the city, literally 80 strategic plans for the city, and no one sense of, you know, what is the vision, what is it the city needs. There was loads of shouting and crying, or as people used to say, used to, the, the dairy was very balanced because it had chips on both shoulders. Um, you know, the, the Glen Shane Pass was the, the ultimate of cowboy country. Um, you know, look at all the Emmons up in Belfast. That was the cynicism um, that we were operating in. Really, it really was. And um, we went in very strongly, again with help from NISRA colleagues and others. And we set about, um, you know, trying to set up a process. We started with a future search process to try and get a whole systems piece. Um, and it, it was really extensive process, but I remember being in, in the uh, strategy group, where, which was mainly the pol local politicians, and one of them stood up and actually said, look, we want to have a really good sound evidence base here, because when we walk up that hill in Belfast, we want to be sound, we want to know that we can stand up and say, this is the definitive plan for the city, and you have to take notice. And that was the truth, that, that was really the attitude, and there was a total unanimous agreement to, yeah, we need the evidence, we need to prove what it is we want. So we set about it in two ways, and to me the magic formula is extensive engagement plus intensive analysis gives you good policy. So in terms of the extensive engagement, um, we set up, as I said, there was 120 involved in the first uh, future search. It went into 12 sectoral working groups. There was nearly 500 people involved in those groups. Out of that, um, we developed the plan. Um, there was 189 actions, uh, which, we got, which we got down to 159. You can imagine the prioritization, the negotiations, all of the iterations. Um, and we aligned that, all this, the, the wish of people. We, we worked with, uh, we did 44,000 households. We did 22,000 school kids, nerve center design, two beautiful books for kids from uh, not to seven and seven and above. Um, we, and if you get something into a school bag, you get a message home, let me tell you, because when they have to go back and report to the teacher that they talked to their mum and dad or mummy and daddy about what was in it. Um, and we did, uh, there was at that time now, and we're talking quite a few years ago now, digitally with a thousand people regularly online uh, giving us opinions. We did plans to 5,000 key stakeholders. Uh, you know, there was an extensive um, putting out there. Uh, and we held, you know, we held plenary sessions at certain stages. We did integration meetings across the 12 groups net, so that the 12 groups were all comparing where they were. And out of that, we got down to 11 uh, projects under five core themes, uh, one of which, for example, was study of culture. Um, so what I'm saying to you, there was a, a, a iterative a sense of engagement. But against that, we professionally then fed in because we had um, city scope. Uh, which was I would, uh, uh, an exemplar best practice where we went out and we advertised. We wanted to get the impact on the 10% most deprived wards in the city. 
and we advertised it in Chantal and the Chantal community uh, organization as it was at the time, and it's now Social Enterprise as a result, won the tender. They trained 85 local people to go out and do 480 interviews at a regular state, literally out in the neighborhoods. So you were you you had you were um, given a skill set to local people and you get right down to where no enumerator from you know statutory source had been able to go really down below the radar. Um, and that was tracked over a period of years. And um, we did we had um, space syntax come in and did the spatial analysis. Uh, Oxford Economics came in and did an econometric model. Um, the, we did the future search exercise to get the, the whole systems piece. Uh, OECD came in and did a, a critique and actually did come out very positively to say it was one of the best pieces of integrated planning that they had seen. Um, so what, what that was was the reassurance of the engagement so you had the voice and the analysis so you had the data and the evidence and then the merging of two into one plan which led to it going into the, to the last programme for government. And a lot of people said, how the hell did you go? Because the politicians had the assurance and the people recognised what was in there because it was their voice. So for me, that's success. That's how you do good evidence gathering. It's bloody hard. It really is. Um, but to sum it up, there's an old American um, uh, proverb that says, you know, if you tell me, I forget. If you show me, I may not remember. But if you involve me, I'll understand. And it's that piece about if people understand the story they're hearing, it's about creating and making the stories. I was in this room yesterday um, where the university held a major uh, conference on Brexit and Matthew Taylor was speaking. And I was struck by one of the examples he gave where, uh, and you might, some of you might remember it, the mayor of Oklahoma had been presented with all the evidence about rising levels of obesity and the impact they were having on the medical system there. Um, and that it really was crisis proportions. Uh, but he was quite a large gentleman himself. So just before, I think it was Christmas time, he stood up and he actually said to people, uh, look, I need to lose weight, but I need a million pounds uh, of support around the state. Will you join me? And he had a hugely successful campaign. Now, if he had gone out and said, I'm presenting a strategy for uh, you know, the defeating of obesity in the state of Oklahoma, you, you people are going right, very nice, there go. But because he was putting up a personal challenge and setting it in a different context and getting people involved in it with him, it had a huge impact on the on the, the whole issue of obesity. So the, we need to tell the stories, we need to give the politicians the stories, they need to be authentic and real, and they need to be based on really good grounded evidence. Um, and that's, I genuinely found it, government ministers and local government representatives do get that if it's if it's framed with them um, and for the people they represent. So thank you. Yeah. Yes. Well, okay, well, and, uh, and I very much take that theme at Aideen's point there. I mean, I, 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 about involvement in process. I mean, looking at the exam question we were given, how can the government make the best use of evidence? I, mean, I don't think it's an issue of us lack of of evidence out there, or even lack of ability to kind of work on that process. Um, my office, when I left it uh, two years ago, I retired, was full of very good documents, evidence, right across, and wall to wall Northern Ireland strategies, too many of which I was involved in writing with the last 20 years, and they were basically ignored by us all. We wrote them. We are great at writing strategies. Northern Ireland, we launched more strategies than we launched boats. I mean, you know, we just, we, we're very good at that point. We're good in that strength. But there's a question about our demand for evidence and strategy in politics. And the, the complexity we are facing in, these 20, in the 20 years since devolution of our confidence that actually we can do it. Um, I think that's a really big issue for us. Um, uh, and uh, it's about, therefore, us recognizing that we're, we are in this, we'll, we'll get back there, we'll get back to some form of system, we'll hopefully and we'll get back, but we have to collectively agree that we all have a role in building a sense of anger and worry about the sheer size of the issues we have to deal with. This morning was that, I didn't read the detail of it, but a quarter of our children are overweight, right? So we know a quarter of our children already by that stage are quite likely to face health issues which we've set for them, and we sort of don't mind about these issues. We're sort of complacent, aren't we? 
uh, and there's a politics around that. We have an evidence base that actually we are, we just get on, keep on going. So there's a bit about us where we actually have to change the dynamics of, and the demand for believing that we can do things in that process. So we have to create a politics which is really about people's needs. We understandably, we have constitutional obsessions and issues. There's an important aspect, but we have to try and get that obsession down to that in place so we can also deal with need. And I think that really comes back to the one key issues. Unless we do that, you know, we can play around with evidence as we did over the last 20 years, but we're not going to do that much with it. Um, we all have to a role to play in it. I mean, clearly there's an issue for us as uh, for politicians. There's a clear issue, may I say, for uh, for uh, as uh, as electors, uh, people who, in the, uh, who elect them. We're we're fairly awful to our politicians, may I say. We give them hell on lots of our constituency issues, but we don't stand back and give them the space when they have to deal with the, the wider difficult issues. We all look at our self-interest and our we fight our own bit, but we're not good at giving that broader support. And I think we have to give. You know, I mean, I don't I'm not saying. Uh, the May solution, for example, on the question of uh, uh, how we deal with social care and age is the right answer. But we actually all know that somehow we're going to have to put out more money, and those of us who have more money are going to have to put something around that in the process. And immediately everybody attacks it. It, it actually, we, you know, that's something that's been around for 10 years. We know it's going to be a massive issue that will destroy that, our health system unless we can deal with care for the elderly. We've, a, we've, a, we've got all the evidence, brilliant reports produced 10 years ago, and we've walked away from that, and we haven't given our politicians any ability to down, deal with issue, and yet we know that will destroy our health system. So we actually have to, as a do that. As public officials, yes, we have to do a good job in that process. We have to be very open about that process. May I say the third sector? I think a big issue here, it always frustrates me. So many in Northern Ireland, we have great charities, and lots of them with policy officials, and I saw damn all coming out. I saw very little stuff really other than lobbying, often on behalf of the interests of their charity, really compelling stuff. It was not, for the amount of resource we put in there, I don't think we were producing the results. Like, you know, was, so I think there's an issue there. Academia as well, as, as Gretchen said, I think there's a big issue there of how do we get that person, and a complex issue, because Academia has got many issues it has to deal with in person. The dialogue has not been rich here. There have been some very good, I mean, Derek's work on that, lots of areas have been very strong, individual areas and strong contacts and areas have worked well. But overall, for example, I think Cardiff, for example, in the Welsh system, but it does seem to be a better dialogue there. And I think we need to learn from that person. But the point is we all have to build our capabilities and our attitudes. I think the idea of an institution, what works at its centre, Interesting idea. I don't think one institution is going to be a solvent in the process. There's a mixed, I think, uh, the what works process, I think a slightly mixed in the process. Um, but I'd, it always comes back to me about this issue of building a political culture that wants to use evidence. Going back to so the, the issue, I suppose, you know, what, what is the evidence that really does make political change? And my experience always was, I mean, in the highest order was the constituents who had really got under my minister's skin at the weekend and who had given them some idea and that was the one that really did impel politicians to really make life, our lives hell, in, in, you know, usefully hell in the office. Um, so actually that, because that, it, it gave them an, a story and an issue they could understand and they could move. So those compelling stories were, were very key. Excellent local examples where people had actually solved problems often were one of the best the best things, and that, you know, good examples. We've got lots of really good projects around, around Northern Ireland, and a lot of those things were actually, those could be really powerful. And somebody reminded me recently, uh, it was, an Aaron Berben had run a health system in Tredegar when he was the MP there for 10, 15 years before he got into power. And basically, the, the model of the NHS was developed by the local people in Tredegar over 15 years, working with the business people and the, the, the GPs. And actually it was he, he had got it, and he had got that compelling story, so when the medical establishment tried to stop him, he was able to say, stuff it, I've seen it work. And so those things are very powerful. We often found, I mean, so often I found that my job was 
could I find good stories and get, could I raise the profile of them? Because that was the one that made change. Could I get my minister to see that group project, to understand that that school was really sorting something and was something that was worth her time thinking about getting more white. That was often the evidence. It wasn't some academic document or paper. It was something that, and one of the things we did, I mean, uh, both uh, AD and I work in, in Dell, um, one of the great examples, we found basically in, 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 uh, in the Carolinas, North, 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 North Carolina, a really good FE system. We've reformed the FE system in order to, one of the great, have been a really successful. And that was because we found a great example of really good community colleges there, which fitted well with what we wanted to do here. And we got them, and they were really good. They gave us the detail, they showed us the evidence, they were quite often telling us this might work here. This big thing is we were able to get our politicians and our people in the FE colleges on the planes to see it. And that evidence was the thing that changed. Right? We could have written lots of papers, it wouldn't have gone, but actually they were able to speak to no-nonsense people from North Carolina who told them as it was and gave them, and it came here and helped us do it here. So those are very, I mean, those examples were, were, were absolutely crucial. And may I say one of the, about evidence-based, I worked in Brussels for a while, so it's a mystery to me, how did Luxembourg government work? Because, for example, the Department of Health in Luxembourg has got eight members, and one's the driver and one's the minister. So it's got really uh, And so I talked to them once about how did they do it, and they said, you know, here it is, one of the most successful countries in Europe with 320,000 citizens, but very rich and doing quite well. And they said, well, look, the evidence is quite simple for us. There are three policy areas, there are four areas, really. The three policy areas which are unique to Luxembourg, basically the steel, some of their agriculture and their financial services. We put a lot of time into giving evidence about that because we really want to win that. The other bit of evidence we know is that the Dutch are very sensible and they're fairly similar to us. So for every other policy, we ask, the only evidence we need is what the Dutch do. <laughs> and, I mean, I, I don't want to be cynical, but the point is we often in Oman have to devise, spend a lot of time devising you know, doing the Northern Ireland on things where somebody else actually has proved a fairly good solution. And I just think, you know, let's keep it in the process. Uh, there, there, there's one. Um, I may say, so those, is, the compelling, I may say, on the data, I mean, I did find speech writing with a few compelling statistics actually often get, get more change in the process than you can imagine. Uh, it was really important to know your data uh, in, in that process. And I say, the range of that process, the, a well-written lobby document can be really powerful, it's, it is done well. Academic studies can play the role. Uh, in my department of social development, work in the university here on fuel poverty um, and on how we could try and focus fuel poverty. I've done really excellent work on your colleagues here. Actually, really powerful. So I'm not saying that there are not different roles to be played that issue, but it's using that range of process. But I go back to the issue, we have to be angry and we're worried, and we have to compel, we, this is important stuff, and we have to wisely use it. I just wanted to uh, yes. say thanks for the, for the useful information. I had a question about um, useful evidence, and from my perspective, I've worked with a number of um, councils throughout the UK. Sorry, my name is Albert Hamilton. I, I run a, a market research company. Um, I find that councils throughout the UK rate experience over evidence. They rate that because we've done it this way for so long, this is the right way to do it. Um, and I find that very frustrating because good evidence um, changes. Good evidence uh, is, is derived from, as you say, from stories, and stories continually happen. But because um, uh, experience says it's, it has to be done this way, we, we often find our, in, in, our com in our company um, that, that useful evidence is, it doesn't find a place. Um, and assessing the ability to provide useful evidence is based on experience and the trusted method of doing things. I'd just like to get your thoughts on that, if that's possible. Thanks. Well, I kick off just, I mean, just to say, I mean, I, I think, I mean, the point is it's about political 
maturity and confidence, isn't it, in a certain sense. Um, and that's where I think I go back to my North Carolina experience, where you actually can show them where you not only have got some evidence, but you've got somebody evidence of somebody else doing it in a different way, so they can actually go and see it or lift the phone to talk to it on the handling of it, because I think it's, it's about that, that issue of concern about, uh, I mean, we all know in policy terms, writing a policy or strategy is the easy bit. It's 90% it's about delivery, isn't it? It's about getting the change and getting staff to do it and getting public to understand all, all those issues. That's, the, that's where the politician usually gets, gets hung out to dry. So to give them the confidence, you have to get, if you can get them to somewhere who, who says, actually, it's been done and it's, it's been passed. And that, hence, the point about piloting, is, it, it likewise, is the one which we, we often use to try and build the confidence in the system or in the politician or the people to say, can work. One of the things that, that I find very interesting is that um, I think it's that it's the reassurance that look, we've always done it that way, so we're just going to stick with it. And that would be very frustrating for a private sector company, which is why some of the, the uh, work that what works and the Alliance are doing uh, about sharing practice elsewhere so that you can, the examples you wouldn't ever dream of knowing. And I mean, one, one that recently that Carnegie did that was really successful and, and surprised Carnegie was they put out a lot of work on the enabling state change in the, the, the nature of provision of, of government and practice and they decided to do a, a challenge competition and they put it out um, asking there's eight stages to the enabling state so they put it out and asked for people to come forward with good best practice and they had 122 entries uh, from across the UK they were expecting about a dozen and out of that you know 21 shortlisted right down and it was an application process and it was it was everything it was a three minute video um, and you know a fairly short thing but fantastic examples it's called evidence from innovators and it's you know it's for people like you particularly in the private sector as well as others where do I go to find out is there another way of doing this and then if you're presenting them to a client look you've always done it this way but what is it telling you and do you want to know something different and um, here's ways and means so sometimes it's just like it's the show me piece you know involve me in it um, and I th so I think something like this this sort of challenge thing I think Carnegie will continue to do but there's a lot of people out there unexpected sources um, and if whatever their poli the councils want to know you know questioning a council is this really what you want to know would you not need, would you not like to know instead um, and almost challenging them imposing it and quite often and I think you will find people open to that if you've got an answer to the what is it you don't know so it's about doing good homework as well yeah, I think that, you know, now is quite a good time in terms of there have been lots of disruptive technologies, so people are seeing those big channel shifts. So there's more of an opportunity now to say, actually, could we do this completely differently? So what I wasn't sure from your question with the event that they're simply interested more in, as a service provider, they're interested in people's experience of using their service, or whether it's more about um, just the being complacent about we've always done it this way or not. Complacency side. Sorry? Complacency side. Yeah. Thank you. Two questions, but the biggest first. Callum will handle me. Uh, I was struck when I was one time looking at how Europe worked, and quite recently about a decision on of the in Europe about one of the pesticides that had taken 11 years to come to the conclusion that it was bad for bees and plants and everything else. And yet, on the final stage, it was overturned because of strong lobbying. So therefore, my first question is, in a diagram about policy, delivery, and statistics, where does the lobby fit, fit in? Because a lot of the lobby's material in Europe, I understand a lot of the evidence in some quick details so was only available from, in fact, the commercial side of the businesses. So they have that and they treat as confidential information, but they feed it into the system. So it's not public research and it's not public evidence, it's actually private lobby evidence, and it can be quite powerful, in a, certainly in the European setting, but also in local government and our rather regional government as well both in all of our assemblies. There's quite a strong lobby group in all types as well that operate. Now, 
you might say lobbyists or uh, public evidence or available evidence will counter that. But I'll take two other recent steps. One is an old one. If you recall, a number of years ago, there was a massive amount of evidence about the dangers of smoking. But there was also a massive amount of other evidence out there saying, oh, it's not really, it's all other particles and never. And a lot of that was funded by the tobacco companies. Now, eventually that got overread, but what you have now in the situation is there's a lot of evidence saying about sugar. <laughs> and then there's a strong lobby group saying, oh no, there isn't. And even trying to get a very simple thing that everybody is aware of, of red, uh, the, the traffic light system. Some people have adopted that, some people haven't. But again, it's the same group. There's a lot of lobby evidence to say, no, sugar, oh, no, it's not, it's, it's hot drugs, it's money saturates and all that stuff, but it doesn't. So there's a lobby private sector evidence, which is not a bit necessary in the public sector, but it's important to, have, to look at the study. And then there is uh, the public evidence as well, so it's trying to get the right balance. But okay. last, I don't want to ask a question. I was interested in uh, reading an article, of, I think around Christmas, by two Jewish scientists who said that it's, it's actually what you ask. So the, the, the question was, uh, you're talking to a patient and you say, look, this operation is important to do, but I have to advise you, there's a 90% chance that it'll be work. And what do you feel about that? And you got a very good response to that. The person said, yes, okay, it's worth the risk. But when they asked the same question, the other way around, saying, look, you've got this operation, uh, but there's a 10% chance that it won't work. What do you think? And they got the same, same evidence, the same situation, but they got the reverse answer, the response to the So my point is, sometimes it actually is, what is the question you're asking? As well, that has to be important. Thanks for listening to me, but by the way, thank you. Anyone like to respond? I just think we've lots of evidence that shows that even when we have the evidence, it doesn't influence our behaviors. Um, lots of people, we know that, um, Obesity, or eating too much is bad, or never drinking too much. Does that mean that we stop doing it? Not necessarily. So there's, you know, that big disconnect between having the evidence and um, doing the right thing based on that evidence. Yeah. And that's politics. Yeah. Well, obviously not necessarily politicians. No, but they influence politics. Yeah. You know, I think, I think for public servants it's about integrity and you know reporting as best they can. I'm being open to how am I framing this question and you know am I just doing this for, because that's the way we've always done it. Um, and, and we all get into a rut of the easiest things to just keep rerunning. But I think there is a really interesting um, element at the minute, you know, I think the new programme for government for example has thrown up um, a real challenge about outcomes that people felt. Sometimes you get at a point where you feel, yes, yeah, right, that's right, that makes more sense than what we did before. You know, we've all used um, the standard measures of things, um, but did, uh, how do we know that's impacting on that, etc., the joining up? So I think now it's quite, I, ironically, when we're in such challenging political times, I think within government there's a real appetite, and community planning as well, and local, gov and local government is adding to that where we actually can start to reshape and use, for example, our near neighbours of Scotland who have been very helpful in the same analogy as North Carolina that, that um, well used, uh, you know, don't reinvent wheels. Um, Department of Justice in Scotland have done some really interesting work um, and have now got the, the, they're coming out the other end after seven years with real sense of this is actually the right things to measure. So, you know, take things that we know are working elsewhere. Um, so I, I think, but it's a continual debate about the bottom line, are we asking the right question? And indeed, are we asking the right people those questions? Have we got people with authority, resources, expertise, information, and need all involved in the conversation as well? And that's the hardest piece, uh, uh, you know, to get that whole system bit in place. I see Brenda and then Derek. Look, I'm Brenda Kent of Community Evaluation in Northern Ireland, and it kind of leads on to, from that question about access to data, but a slightly different slant on it, which is, 
Do you think there ought to be a campaign against useless evidence? <laughs> in that, and you mentioned the programme for government there, and I'm sorry, well you said, you know, from the third sector there's not a lot of compelling evidence coming out. At the moment there's a sense that there is so much evidence and data to be collected, but there is no conviction that it will be used. Either the political will isn't there, or it isn't suiting an agenda, or it's not understood how it's going to be used, and a lot of it may well sit on the top of cupboards. So my question is, is there a sense that there's a growing amount of useless evidence that is under which the useful evidence might be hiding? I wonder if we take Derek's question as well and maybe join them up. Derek, do you want to yeah, 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 contribute well, to this point? <coughs> Definitely. Uh, uh, we're just thinking of the, um, there's a lot of research on policy making that shows that policy makers, irrespective of how good the data or evidence is, Will, will tend to scan it un until they pick out the bits that accord with their their own ideas or ideologies or priorities and will reject the rest. And you can, you can think of, I'll just mention very briefly, two examples in Northern Ireland, maybe academic selection, and that it almost doesn't matter what how good the research is um, about, say, the impact of disadvantage, it, it won't actually affect the key policies, or in England, welfare reform, or UK welfare reform, where in fact the objective of welfare reform was, was not to make people better off, but it was to realise the conservative idea of fairness, to produce fairness, so it had as very much uh, an ideas um, uh, obje objective. Uh, that was just two comments, but the, the question really I had was, um, I oft, I've often thought that one of the main differences with, with Northern Ireland and GB is um, and, uh, it's been disappointing the work of the assembly committees because in GB uh, parliamentary select committees produce very good evidence and very good almost research reports which does have quite a lot of impact and I think in, in Northern Ireland uh, it's been very weak the sort of work that's been produced by the assembly committees. Okay, who wants to talk about useless evidence first? Yes. Well, the, uh, just to differently, the answer is, my point was, evidence is not being used. It's just unused evidence. That's what our truck system is. There's not, there isn't, I mean, there isn't that level of demand in our, in our political process in sense, for evidence, because I'm not sure there's the confidence about doing policy in, it, in, in, a, in a great sense from the parties or from the political structures. That has not been... The focus has been more on constitutional or wider issues, very much focus on, on I mean, that the key policy issue has been how can I get budgets for the areas I want, you know, I and my party want to put money into. There's been a focus very much on that budgetary policy, frankly, was for sort of the, the ten, first 10 years of, uh, of devolution was the big issue. That was the one they focused on every now. How big is my budget? What was, it? What was the, the key uh, the element? Actually, how you were using the budget or what it was being, you know, process was, of, I felt, of a second order often in that, in that debate. Um, so, I mean, I, just, I do think there is, it's that issue of the use of it, the confidence of using it, what was the big, big problem. Going on to the committee, I mean, and I think there's some colleagues from, from the assembly behind you there, I, think that's, I, I do think, I mean, it was that question because of the lack of demand from the, I didn't see many committees really feeling the confidence that they would produce, or it was actually often, it was, I, I felt rather disappointed. I, 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 likewise, I had hoped that that would provide a basis for really good cross discussion and ex exploration of issues, ideally ones which were not uh, you know, party issues in a sense, where you could have genuinely built up a broader consensus um, across that. But that just, I mean, I can rarely think of any, uh, I can't think of anything that produced it in, in that way. I can make one other point that somebody said about. I mean, I think it's also interesting in Northern Ireland, we don't really have policy, policy people per se, because most Northern Ireland public servants, and I'm sure it's local governments, they, are, they will do a bit of policy, but they'll be also uh, delivering a lot of time. Actually, there's, there's, good, there's, there's strength in that element. Many people are very realistic, they're very good at that sort of balance, uh, and since delivery is very important, that there are, it's not the worst thing that people have to do that, but actually there are very few people who are, you know, and that, hence the point, People do scan. People go very quickly because, frankly, they've got a lot of things in their place, and that's a realistic effort. You have to 
in looking at the analytics, you, I, I used to say, I mean, people used to, who came into my office, they, they staff always worried, said, you know, Will is a nice guy, but you've got seven minutes if you haven't explained to him in seven minutes, he blanks out, you know, I think that's probably true. <laughs> I don't, I don't know the answer, I suppose. Um, again, there's this point, we're a smaller system, the select committee, you write the quality of, of quite a lot of the things that come out of the select committee, genuinely does influence and they've got a they've got a resource behind them to allow for the research and the evaluation and the gathering in. And you've got a political, in inverted commas, stability, I'm using the word, um, but you know, maturity um, there that our, I think our committees are only starting to get into um, the, their groove um, I think the programme for government was starting to do the joining up um, that hadn't happened before. I think local government's much better um, at, you know, because it's had a longer, more, in inverted commas, again, I'm using them a lot, but uh, now, uh, you know, I think even the fact the merger of local government has actually been, I know for those in the throes of it, it's been mm -hmm. like a whirlwind, but it has actually come through very effectively, and mergers, etc., etc. Um, and it's, it's based on policy-delivery. People are, are developing policy because they're delivering the services and therefore they're close to the ground. They know what the need is, they're coming back, they're, they're getting expert advice where they need it to help advise them. They're engaging with the, the rate payers, etc. I think we're, we're missing that piece at the level up in the assembly. Though, interestingly, the first assembly we had where the majority came from local government, I thought was fairly solid. Um, I think it, it, you know it, it's maybe shifted slightly. I mean, it's not fair to put public servants in the audience on the on the spot and ask of their of their opinion. I wouldn't expect them to, but I think there, there was a sense of doing their best. Uh, I think the support to the committee structures tended to be more secretariat as opposed to policy development. Um, they struck it lucky with a few things where they were able to go and source expert advice, and you're always going to have to do that. Um, but again, I think the bottom line is about trying to keep the politicians in alignment. One that strikes me as an example in my early days, I'll never forget it, because I, we went without any evidence. Uh, one of my ministers was convinced it was around the time of the soccer. Do you remember the Windsor Park incidences? Some of you won't, but there was awful sectarian um, events at Windsor Park, and the minister of the day came in the next day genuinely um, upset by the, what had happened and said, that's it, we have to get young people together, we have to use soccer as a media, I was in detail at the time, uh, which was affectionately known as the Department of Crack Alcohol and Laughter, who I, I always said, as I said before, uh, charismatic dynamic leadership, but um, this minister wanted, he just came in, as, as, as Will was saying, sometimes it is only one, and said, if we can get young people early on through soccer, across the community, across all the clubs, etc., etc., a, a bit of funding, and a bit of funding turned out to be millions, um, and invested, and the IFA were a basket case at the time, I'm not, I'm not going to comment on their current position, but they really were a basket case, and um, that initiative, I remember going in and fighting at the, a budget meeting with no evidence other than gut, the gut feeling that if we could do it at that level, and it actually has paid off, here we are, like, you know, please God, decades later, and it genuinely did start to diffuse the situation. Um, so sometimes you have to work backwards because we had to rapidly, as government's uh, advisors and ministers, go back and get the evidence. We didn't take too long to prove the need, um, but the impact, what, what, how could we use this? Um, and in a way, you know, that's lost. I think we've lost some of that gut instinct stuff because we've become so hidebound by bureaucracy and ticking boxes and having to have everything in place. Sometimes you have to create policy in a, in a, in a situation where you just really need to get on with something. And sometimes if it's retrospective fit, I'm sorry, I don't apologise for it. Um, because I think sometimes we forget to listen to the gut instinct piece. And that's where we use useless evidence, maybe not the useful. And I just think there's a common thread between the two questions. And it's about having a sophisticated and literate challenge function and that can understand the evidence, can point out where it's flawed, if it is flawed but it can also point out the selective use of evidence and challenge that, mm -hmm. and whether that's the electorate, whether it's the media, whether it's select committees, whether it's within the policy development process. Quite a few of the Whitehall policy departments are moving away from having policy specialists, because policy specialists who don't think about how the hell are we going to implement this tend to develop 
poorly policies that are difficult to implement. So that integration between how are you going to make it work in practice becomes really important and you end up with a better cycle rather than suddenly discovering that, oh, actually, we can't do this. Um, so I think, you know, the key thing is about having people who can challenge it and can call yeah. to account to say, actually, that evidence is incorrect or there's an alternative here. And, and I must say, as a permanent secretary, if my head of stats or whatever had come to me and said, look, X is known to work or Y, or this is, look at the impact of it, you listen because you know you're getting an, you know, a, an expert opinion with no bias. So there's, it's a two-way piece that the, the, the people gathering the evidence feel at the, the, the point are they going to be listened to. Um, so you know, within government, if there's a means to do that, but I think the delivery point's a key one. I'm conscious of time is again. Can we take one last round of questions then? Any burden issues that people would like to raise at this point? Last chance, go in. <laughs> well, if not, I'd just like to close the event. Once again, thank you very much for taking, giving us your time this afternoon. Um, thanks to our speakers, and I, I hope you've enjoyed their, their contributions. Thanks to Ulster University for hosting the event. Hopefully you'll follow um, this debate um, on online uh, media and um, hopefully you'll engage again with the Alliance for Useful Evidence. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. 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 Yes.